You're just going to fillet this sucker right off the bone. Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Fish Out Northwest, waiting on Tommy Don. One. This is what you call a bait stop. Hello and welcome to Fish Out Northwest. Wayne England coming to you from the Fish Out Northwest studio located here in Olympia, Washington. And yes, Tommy is gone once again, but not flying solo this evening. Oh, did I tell you you have co-host responsibilities? No. We'll have to renegotiate our Okay, contract. negotiating contract after the fact. But uh, Don New from Hatchery Wild is here uh, this evening to help me out and have a number of discussions that I think you, uh, you all are going to enjoy for sure. Um, so before we delve into the show and what we got going on, especially with Don here this evening, uh, I want to remind everybody, especially if you're joining us here first time on Root Sports, uh, go ahead and check out all our social media platforms. You can get there simply by going to our webpage, www.fishhuntnw.com. There you're also going to find a couple of coupons to your advantage. FHN20, edge rods, 20% off edge rods all the time through the coupon at checkout, FHN20. And then, of course, with Phelps Game Calls, Fish Hunt NW10, all Phelps Game Calls for the entire year will be 10% off. Uh, utilizing that code once again at checkout. So take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, get your hands on some edge rods. You, they'll, they'll be extremely happy they did. Isn't that right, Don? That's right. Yeah, best rods in the Northwest, hands down. You're going to save 20% through Fish Hunt Northwest. So, uh, hey, a couple, uh, couple quick shout-outs here. You know, this show survives based on the, uh, the number of sponsors that we have and their contribution to what it is that we are doing that they believe in. And, you know, I bought that 21-foot uh, Mustang, that uh, hardtop Mustang a couple years ago, 2021. And uh, it was the sixth boat built out of the Allied shop in the Mustang hardtop series. And so as we move forward in the future, my vinyl on my flooring started uh, loosening up, started bubbling up or coming uh, delaminated from the glue adhering. And so I made a call to a friend out there, Chris Mossman, the service manager at Defiance, um, and told him what was going on, took some pictures, and he got a hold of Joe over there at the Allied shop. They had me bring it out yesterday morning and completely pulled the seats out in the cab and took everything out, ripped up all four boards, completely cleaned them, replaced with new updated uh, new type of vinyl, new type of glue that they're no longer using the stuff from previous. Like I said, it was the sixth boat built, so we find a few things that happened. But the, the takeaway here is the extreme uh, outgoing of customer service between Defiance Marine and the Allied Boat Shop. Uh, hats off to uh, Brandon running the Allied Shop and Joe uh, in the uh, in the finish uh, shop doing all the work, uh, him and his guys. Um, Chris Mossman at the service desk there at Defiance Marine, of course, Bo Palmer, the owner. I'm telling you guys, if you're looking for a Defiance, an Arima, an Allied, all those boats manufactured right there throughout that facility, and the service you're going to get through Defiance Marine is second to none. So before you pull the trigger on your next boat, make sure you check out and talk to the folks out there at Defiance Marine. They are definitely going to take care of you. All right, a little shout out to them because they're doing such a, a great job. Anyway, um, running down the show, we got a number of things to tackle this evening. In studio guests here, Don New, director at Hatchery and Wild, coexists. Several topics to cover and updates to bring you, uh, to you. I think you're going to enjoy our conversations and learn a ton from this gentleman here in studio tonight. Then we're going to tie in with buddy Eric Broughton. He is the admin, one of the admins at Washington State Wild Turkey Hunting Club. I refer to him as the turkey whisperer. Uh, hey, it's preseason and getting ready prior to this April 1st opener on the youth hunt. What should you be doing? Eric's going to let you know. Uh, after that, we got a short video on a previous turkey hunt. It's the infamous, as I referred to, the infamous turkey backflip. How it all went down and, of course, a prize pack giveaway right after that. So stay tuned for that. Then we'll get back in here with Don uh, walking through the, the couple topics. Um, recreational angling, hatcheries, the economic impact, there's a lot of information here. 
on a study that was performed and some of the numbers we take away from that, uh, pretty compelling. Then also we're gonna be back in the bait lab tonight. Springers are in the air and on the minds of many. Rigging for springers, inline flashers or 360s, what would you like to use and why? And then of course we'll close it out with Don dispelling the myths. Hatchery versus wild hatchery and wild. Uh, do hatchery fish really impact our wild fish uh, to the point that we've been uh, spoon fed for 35 plus years? Don and I are gonna have a discussion and I know you're gonna enjoy the takeaways from there. So don't go anywhere. Tons of info to get through this evening. Coming back in studio after this break with this gentleman to my right, uh, Don New, director at Hatchery and Wild. After this break, right here, Fish on Northwest. Defiance Marine is the one-stop shop for the Pacific Northwest Angler. Defiance Marine guarantees the best price on a new and best service on a repower for your current boat. Defiance Marine is a Honda Premier dealership and one of the largest on the West Coast. Defiance Marine is a boat dealer who proudly sells Defiance, Allied, and Arima boats. All boats are built by West Coast fishermen for West Coast fishermen. Defiance Marine has all your boating needs to help you get out on the water. If you're looking for the best fishing rods in the world, you really do need to take a look at the edge rods. I designed and built new machinery, and I think this new machinery has enabled us to build blanks like no other company can build without this equipment. There is no other rods in the world that are as good as these rods. You owe it to yourself to take a good look at them. For more than 90 years, you've entrusted one brand to guide you towards living the lifestyle you've always dreamed of. Now you can entrust affiliated Better Homes and Gardens real estate professionals to interpret your needs and help you find the home in which to live your dream through every stage of your home buying or selling process. And through every stage of your life, there's Better Homes and Gardens real estate. Expect better. All right, welcome back here in studio to Wayne England Fish on Northwest. And in studio guests this evening, Don New is the director at Hatchery and Wild Coexist. If you haven't heard of this organization before, well, you're going to learn a whole lot about it tonight and for good reason. So uh, welcome to the studio, Don. Thank you. First time yes. you've been here. I've had Dave and Cameron and, yeah. you know, on a number of occasions, the guys have been in. This is the first time you've made yeah. the journey. Yep. So glad you could join us. Hopefully you enjoyed that dinner. Oh, it was really good. Wasn't you you had nothing to do with it, of I, course. Well, <laughs> hey, we all have our roles here, right? It's a five-person no, team. A great job. She does Real an amazing good. job each and every week. So let's talk a little bit about the history of Hatchery and Wild Coexist. Uh, when did it really, you know, take off, or when did you guys initiate this? And kind of describe the genesis of it. What was the driving force to create yet another group as we talk about Hatchery and Wild Fish? Sure. So... Um, it goes back 35 years, more than 35 years, when uh, I was serving on a board called Oregon, uh, organization called Oregon Wildlife Heritage Foundation. And it was really started by Vicatia, who uh, wasn't going to let some people develop part of the Deschutes. So they formed this organization. Uh, Buzz Ramsey brought me into it. And we basically got together with Blitz Weinhardt and uh, raised enough money to buy that land and keep it public. Yeah. Me. Okay, so that was the beginning of it. At that point, we needed to figure out a fundraiser, so we came up with a rendezvous, and we did it for 15, 20 years, and never made any money. We weren't very good at fundraisers. So the uh, North Coast Salmon and Steelhead Enhancement, which is Tim Juarez and Jack Smith and Tillamook picked it up, and they've since turned it into uh, an incredible uh, yearly North Coast rendezvous. Uh, it's all volunteer, so pretty much all but a few percentage points of uh, go into that, uh, go into the, uh, the Tillamook area and, and around uh, Tillamook uh, for enhancement. So for the last 10 or 15 of the years of those events, Jack Smith, 
who's the president of CCA, and Dave Champ, who's the chairman, we all had fished together for years, and we kept saying, we got to change the narrative. We got to, they're, they're killing us. They're, um, the people that uh, want to get rid of hatcheries are winning. They're winning with lawsuits. They're winning not with numbers by any means, but uh, they're winning with dollars, and, and they've got the ear of the, the policymakers and lawmakers. And we started talking about that 10 years ago. Uh, so three years ago, a little less, a little more than three years ago, we, we decided to pull the trigger and uh, start Hatchery Wild Coexist, mm -hmm. Hatchery and Wild Coexist. Um, and we started it by, at the uh, Portland show, sports and show, uh, three years ago. Yep, I strategy, remember. Yep. Strategy was to, we had no credibility. Several organizations, uh, Carmen McDonald, seven or eight years ago, uh, did a film, did a great job, mm -hmm. real smart guy. Yep. Uh, but he passed, yep. and with him, that, that ended. So we are determined, we were determined to start this, start it right, and maintain it uh, with, with one uh, mission, one narrative, and that is to, to change the perception that hatcheries are bad. So, uh, yeah. not to interrupt you, but yeah, you know, that was the driving message when I first met you guys down at that Portland show three years ago or thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, it was, hey, you know, we need to change the narrative. We need to change the narrative. We've been fed this line of how bad or detrimental hatchery fish are to wild fish uh, survivability, and we're going to change that narrative because we have the science to show differently. So, um, do you think that message is getting conveyed out there? I mean, three years running now, you guys have put in a lot of work, a lot of effort. Yeah. Are people starting to grab hold of that concept and is the narrative changing for a per per percentage of folks? Yeah, I mean, there are several gauges for that, in my opinion. One is uh, we're, we've been asked as a brand to, to do joint letters. So our logo goes with established logos on uh, letters to policymakers, lawmakers, uh, people that need to listen to us. Uh, so we're asked to be put in those uh, joint messages. Uh, we started with zero uh, as far as uh, followers on Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. We're up to uh, 13,000. So these are folks that are receiving the message that, hey, you know, everything is not so doom and gloom and, uh, you know, uh, with, with current hatchery, uh, production and putting hatchery fish in rivers and people yeah. are starting to kind of wake up and understand that you know and we're gonna get into this a whole lot more but yeah. there's a lot of benefits to, to hatchery programs and uh, people are starting to understand be, based on your guys's efforts in changing the narrative which is a re-education process for people to understand that yeah it's not all doom and gloom here hatcheries are not the demise of wild fish is that yeah. what we're trying to convey out there right Right, and people will conclude that hatcheries are bad or hatcheries are good, but they won't know why. Yeah, you know, they'll just they will embrace someone's uh, theology, if you mm -hmm. will, about hatcheries being good or bad. So the, our way of cr gaining credibility right away, because people have tried this before and it comes and goes, was to start with business people in the sport fishing business. So I went to Sportco, up, you know, up here, mm -hmm. uh, Outdoor Emporium. They said, of course, Gabe and the guys there, of course, we'll do it, makes sense. So then I went down to Fisherman's Marine and those guys, uh, uh, Fisherman's, uh, immediately said, sure, we'll do it. They embraced it with their stores. And then I came up here to Three Rivers and they said, sure. And then yep. I went down to <clears throat> so, getting uh, Getting businesses on board that are within yeah. the, within the uh, you know, the, the, the footprint of, <laughs> of all of us that are in, in, in this industry. Yeah. So I'm gonna hold you right there. We yeah. got much more to talk about uh, as we delve into this uh, changing of the narrative, hatcheries and wild, hatchery and wild coexist. Uh, Don New is here for the duration. But we have a few more topics to tackle before we get back to that. So we're going to jump out for a quick break. We come back. Eric Broughton from the east side. We're going to talk a little turkey and preseason, what you should be doing right now. Get ready for that youth hunt right here, Fish on Northwest. Allied, the new leader in heavy gauge aluminum boats. Allied boats have standard reverse china and lifting rakes to help you plane faster and run at lower RPMs. Allied boats have several models to choose from, ranging from a 19-foot Mustang all the way up to a 32-foot Liberator. So regardless of what type of heavy gauge aluminum boats you are looking for, Allied Boats will have it for you. Contact Allied Boats today to learn more about these incredible fishing machines.
Welcome back to the show here, Fish on Northwest, Wayne England, and guest in studio, Don New from Hatchery and Wild Coexist. Now, we're going to take a break, a little left turn here from discussing hatcheries and fish. We're going to get back to that with Don in a minute, but real quick while I have him, I want to grab Eric Broughton, bring him on board here, admin at Washington State Wild Turkey Hunting Club. Uh, been a friend for a number of years, phenomenal walleye fisherman, and the turkey whisperer, as I refer to him. Welcome back to the show, buddy. Well, thanks. So, Great uh, to be here. Yeah, nice to have you. Uh, we got a uh, youth opener coming up uh, uh, April 1st, uh, just around the corner. So what should hunters be doing right now to kind of pre-plan or scout or be out there, uh, you know, gathering intel? How, what could they best do right now to get, get ready for that youth opener? Yeah, um, we have a youth week. It's uh, April 1st through the 7th right. uh, now, so to kind of align with spring break. So, you know, a lot of the big flocks in eastern Washington and and uh, down in south southeast and down in the Klickitat, they're all they're all starting to break up. We got a lot of big flocks still. We got a winter is still very prevalent on the landscape. Yeah. Lots of snow. So uh, trying to get um, an area that you can find these birds that um, you can pattern. So if you're uh, if you got a youth and you want to head over to the mountains, I'd I'd come over this weekend or or make a take a few days and get over there and pattern some birds, um, try to find those bigger flocks uh, and just find to find a, an area that you can set up a blind or get uh, you know some permission from some private land if need be, but uh, these bigger flocks as it gets warmer will will start to break up. Um, you'll have you know, right now, a lot of the males and they're fighting and there's a lot of activity out there. So yeah. it's really cool to just have the kids be able to see lots of birds. Um, what it really does is it it's a good time to be you know, spring break and you can actually go over to these small, go over to these small communities, you know, use the small businesses. They look forward to the, the kid week. So, right. I mean, it's it's a great opportunity right there. And then um, as far as. Um, you know, tactics, it's youth season isn't always about killing a bird. It's about making your kids comfortable and having fun. And, you know, our turkey season goes to the end of May. So you really have an opportunity to, you know, really, you know, take advantage of your time with your kids and, and to learn how to turkey hunt. I've been contacted through our club page by tons of first time parents taking their kids out. They're signing up for the online hunter courses through department of fish and wildlife perfect and they're they're getting ready to take those kids out for their first hunt and so you know keep it comfortable if you use a blind those are the best because you can hide the movements of your yeah. kids um bring snacks bring you know lots of warm clothes where it's really cold this this uh it's going to be a cold spring yeah speaking, you know, of, speaking into, of that uh yeah. before we got to wrap it up believe it or not already uh talk a little bit about the weather the uh the points of blinds with kids or fidgety adults is always a solid approach. I like it. Snacks, keep them warm so they enjoy it. Let's talk a little bit about this weather, bird behavior, what you're seeing right now, and what we can probably or maybe project over the next couple weeks. Is it on par for a normal year? Normal year? Is it a little colder right now than it has been? What are these birds doing? Yeah, right now it's it's been in the low 20s, mid 20s uh, in the mornings and moving up into the 40s on average. But up north in Stevens County, it's been a lot colder. We have yeah. snow, a couple feet of snow around 1500 feet. So Boy. I mean, that's pretty low. So we, you know, we have a lot of spring to melt some of that snow. So the birds, you're going to find a lot of birds at lower elevations. They're going to be in those big winter flocks, but I am seeing a lot of feisty gobblers out there. Oh, good! They're fighting each other. They're trying to, you know, vie for those uh, attention for the hens, and they're really trying to uh, do stuff, you know. And so, when you're calling, you know, you're not going to be able to call the whole flock. So, yep. I would get a blind, throw out some decoys, maybe make a few hen calls. Uh, try to be in a good spot where you see lots of bird sign, you know, and take those kids out and let them see that, you know, give yeah. them hear bird gobble. It's really really a fun time in the spring but well I think as we move into is, as we move into spring it's going to be uh it's going to warm up and things are really going to crack off after the opener on the 15th yeah, and that's a great point you know if they don't see the activity or get them onto a bird the first week or two as it warms up and gets later in the season yeah there's more hunters out there but now you've taken what they've learned in the you know, early week and you kind of transition that later into the season and when the birds are more active and spread out you know the chances of them getting one can be pretty good it's uh, it's hunting, right? It's not it's not like you just take them out, whack a bird. You want them to take on that whole experience, put in a little bit of time, and enjoy that uh, 
experience. So uh, again, valid points on keeping them warm and keep them uh, well fed with snacks and some warm hot chocolate and, and uh, keep them in that blind. Or if you're like me, you got to keep me in a blind because you know I move around too much. So uh, anyway, never enough time, my friend. Uh, Going to get you back on a few weeks into the season so we can talk adult tactics and what we should be focused on as we get to that prime time. So appreciate you taking time this evening, buddy. We'll stay in touch and uh, get out there and get a bird with a youth that first week if you would. All right. Appreciate you. You got it. Take care. All right. Eric Broughton, uh, longtime friend, and he and I will be hunting this year together once again, bringing you some great content as we get into our turkey season. Okay. Going to jump out for a quick break. We come back. Got a uh, real short video, previous turkey hunt, the infamous backflip. Don't go anywhere. You're going to enjoy this right here. Fish on Northwest. Sportco and Outdoor Emporium is the largest local outfitter in the Northwest since 1975 providing thousands of people affordable outdoor gear. This summer, make your next outdoor adventure more affordable by shopping at our warehouse style pricing. We are a local Scotty dealer offering sales, service, and repair. Located in Fife and Seattle, come visit us today. The outdoors await you. McCombie's custom lures are made in the Northwest for salmon, steelhead, lake trout, and kokanee. Our products come in a variety of sizes and colors to help you catch more fish. Find our products in stores or at McCombie'sCustomLures.com. Yep, for sure. Oh, yeah. Big fish. Yeah, buddy. Nice fish. Oh, beauty. Gorgeous fish. Bobby's on the board. We got a good one. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, jeez, oh, come on. Nice fish. Nice fish. We're going to show you how to make fishy reels.
Nice shot, Dwayne. Yeah, buddy. Nice shot. Yeah. Nice job. Holy smokes. Wow. That uh, that came together rather quickly. That 410, man. Holy cow. Wow. That dude came walking in and just, he slowed down once, and then he kind of got on the strut, and he slowed down all of a sudden. He made a beeline for that decoy. Oh, yeah. I that, mean, he ended up getting that, uh, going right to that Jake decoy. He yeah. He did not like that. No, he didn't. And he was, uh, he'd made up his mind, and I wasn't going to wait around. You're like, get, <laughs> get him. That 410, right. that thing's like a cap gun. <laughs> you know? That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Huh? Nice bird. Heck yeah. Yeah. You know. It's got an eight inch beard. Yeah, it's not tan, but boy, it's a. Uh, no, but it's, it's a, respectable, huh? Yeah. No, he's he's a dominant bird out here. Yeah. yeah. Let's get this bird out here and head to the truck. All right. Awesome. Go get man. some breakfast. Yeah, there you go. All right, hopefully you enjoyed that. I know we sure did. Uh, test question based on the video coming up right after the break to uh, win one of these two prize packages of Phelps Game Calls and a FHN hat. If you're joining us here on Root Sports, appreciate you tuning in. That's going to do it for us first half of the show. Uh, stick around, second half of the show coming up right after this break. Allied, the new leader in heavy gauge aluminum boats. Allied boats have standard reverse china and lifting rakes to help you plane faster and run at lower RPMs. Allied boats have several models to choose from, ranging from a 19-foot Mustang all the way up to a 32-foot Liberator. So regardless of what type of heavy gauge aluminum boats you are looking for, Allied boats will have it for you. Contact Allied boats today to learn more about these incredible fishing machines. Hey guys, I'm Big Mike. Come on down to the Edge Pro Shop and see me. We've got all the best brands under one roof. We've got Hawken, Procure, Short Bus, Pro Troll, Yakima Bait, Get Them Dry Jigs, Northwest Bait Scent, Daiwa Reels, North Fork Lures, North Wild, Brad's, Superfly, Rocky Mountain Tackle, and of course, the greatest rods ever built, Edge Rods. Hey, welcome back here in studio to Wayne England Fish Show Northwest and guest in studio tonight, Don New, director at Hatchery and Wild. Did you uh, did you enjoy the turkey melee? <laughs> the turkey backflip? Back <laughs> Gymnastics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who knew, <laughs> yes, right? I did. Yeah. That was a uh, backhand spring and round off, actually, is what he pulled off there. So, hey, before we get back to talking uh, Hatchery and Wild, which is why you were here, we got tons more info to get through. Uh, if you are watching the video closely and are on here on the uh, live stream chat this evening, you have an opportunity to win one of these uh, two packets of uh, Phelps Game Calls, either the box call or the diaphragm calls, along with an FHN hat, simply by texting in here and answering the question, what caliber of shotgun was I using in that video? This should not take all too long. First one to answer it correctly um, will uh, will win a combo pack. There you go. Uh, Shane Vanderlinda, first one to get it in. Shane Vanderlinda. Yeah, you guys are li lighting it up right now. But uh, Shane, watch it on Facebook. I see the YouTube numbers coming in as well. But Shane on Facebook. Yes, a, uh, a 410. That's right. So uh, we got your info. I think we know how to get a hold of you and uh, we'll award you handsomely. Now, for the rest of you, we have a, another set of calls, another hat to give away later on in the show. So stick around, don't go anywhere. We still got that one to give away as well. Don, uh, let's get back to our discussion previously 
Atchery and Wild. So the emphasis on changing the narrative. So for years, uh, with all the practices, past practices of hatchery implementation and seeding many rivers with same genetic strain of steelhead, and you know Puget Sound rivers are synonymous with uh, Green River uh, strain of Chinook salmon, right? And they're just taking one genetic footprint and putting it everywhere. And it took years for us to understand that that was truly the demise of survivability of fish, both yeah. hatchery and wild fish. I mean, the hatchery fish weren't like they were just champions of the earth and making it back too, right? So when we talk today's modern conversations with today's science and understanding genetics, DNA sampling, all the things that are going on in the positive realm as it pertains to hatcheries, persons have to be living under a rock to not understand that the hatcheries of today are not the hatcheries of 40, yeah. 40 50 years ago. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the, it seems logical uh, a lot of things that are happening now, the people would have thought about it 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 100 years ago. Sure. In-basin stock. I mean, isn't it logical that you would go with in-basin? And uh, But that wasn't the case. I mean, I think the effort was to create abundance with a bunch of hatchery fish. So, we, so everyone's getting smarter. And, uh, you know, back to the people that are, uh, that are fans of what we're doing, uh, our mission was just to make people smarter, is sure. to get them to really understand when, when an organization that makes clothing, very expensive clothing, comes out with uh, a film called Artificial mm -hmm. and conflates open pen, horrible hatcheries, sure. not hatcheries, but fish farms, yep. with, with inland hatcheries, the, the people that come away being influenced by that, by that are influenced by the drama of a deformed fish or blood and guts in the water. And certainly uh, that makes sense that they might do that because that company did a good job of making people think that. Well, so. so they're not dumb. And they understand that emotional response and outcry yeah. is to their benefit. Yeah. And who, they're, not, they're not producing this product to get it out there in front of us who partake in the resource. The 11% of us in Washington State and the 11 or 12% of you down in Oregon who participate in the resource and enjoy what it is we do, they're catering to the uh, 85 percentile plus that don't have any clue. Right. And if this is their first introduction to that type of practice and they can show that and garner that emotional response, what comes next? Yeah. Ballot propositions, getting it into the voting booths, those types of things, exactly what Humane Society and other organized groups did in the realm of hunting uh, mountain lions and bears with dogs. Yeah. They didn't come after the 3% of us that hunt. They went after the 97% tell that have no clue. Well, so it's a vulnerable lot. Absolutely. The, uh, for us, right out of the chute, when that film hit and we were watching 2.2 million viewers on that site for yeah. artificial, yeah. and the bonehead conclusions that were, uh, or examples that were made, we, we had to make a film. And we got, uh, we got Sam Steelhead Journal and Edge Rods, Procure and Willy Boats funded our first two films. The first one was called Beneficial. Right. And we just, just systematically took eight points and debunked them with facts and, and data. And I would like to think that we were successful with that because we haven't, and I follow this other, this organization that produces, follow them pretty closely. They haven't used uh, open pens with hatcheries in any of their propaganda uh, since then, and that was the main point. But there are many others that they used for, uh, for feeling that they needed to, you know, propagating the whole idea that, that uh, hatcheries were a bad thing. Sure. So we did that, and those four organizations uh, helped fund it. Uh, you know, we, we're a shoestring 501c3, very uh, nonprofit, and we rely on a little bit of merchandise sales and then uh, nice folks that, that understand what we're doing that will give us a few bucks. So the second one was uh, hatcheries are not the enemy, and that was really made for people that have no clue about it and uh, for schools, and uh, that's done very well. We, we really don't have any money to promote things, so we have to get it out there and hope that our fans will pass it on, and we're trying to make it really easy to mm -hmm. pass on this information. Yep. So that's what we're doing. We're passing on. The only the only sideways move we've made is we've really embraced 
uh, the fact that people need to understand broodstock programs. Right. Because they are good. And we don't want it to go the way. And obviously, there are naysayers on broodstock. So we're trying to get out ahead of it. Uh, we've, we've done a primer, a printed primer that's available uh, as a booklet or on our website. Mm -hmm. All our films are available on our website and our YouTube channel. But you can get that booklet. And then I guess at some point, we'll talk about the economic plan. Yeah, yeah. Going to definitely get into that. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a effort in re-educating the masses. Even those of us within the user group that are kind of on the fence about, eh, you know, I just we've been doing hatcheries forever and the fish aren't coming back. But, you know, there's a there's a 27 year study you guys have posted up there yeah. on the Hood River uh, steelhead. And I found it compelling. A lot of the information now, a lot of it is above my uh, <laughs> my uh, college grade, uh, you know, yeah. level of read. But I 95 percent of it, I, I digest and understand the takeaway in the message here is that, you know, there's a lot of evidence that the impacts to the survivability of steelhead, both hatchery and wild, are a number of contributing factors. Some of them are completely out of our control, which we are very well familiar with now. Um, and it's hard when managing fisheries to gauge that, but it's, you know, ocean conditions uh, is the huge outlier that just can change things on an mm -hmm. instant, right? So we have ocean conditions. We have obviously loss of habitat, which is one that is conversed about regularly and monies are appropriate to try and regain some of that habitat to, uh, to uh, hopefully uh, be successful in finding wild fish, having a higher survivability of natural spawning mm -hmm. in, our, in our rivers, right? Um, you know, we can go down the whole list of, you know, hydro impact, out migrant smolt, uh, smolt uh, inception, interception by, uh, you know, bird predation, uh, pinniped predation, you know, in, in pollutants in the water. I mean, there's a, there's a list a mile long of all the things that are impacting the survivability of smolt and the ability of fish to return. So this, uh, these camps that are planting the flag in the ground to say hatchery fish <laughs> are the demise of wild fish survivability, uh, I, this, this particular study uh, debunks a number of the earlier studies that were so hell-bent on proving their theory. It's like they got money from certain entities. It's like, here's a couple thousand dollars, but I want to make sure that the end result is what we need it to be, right? right? Yeah, I mean, history is the enemy of a lot of the uh, zealots on the, on the non, you know, the shut down the hatchery side. Sure. It really, uh, when you have these studies, 27 years, Ian Corder did his on the Clackamas uh, 28 years later. So it is really the enemy of, of, of some of these uh, groups. Uh, that, and all we want to do is show data. I mean, you, you look at, uh, for example, up at Willamette Falls. Uh, our, our department used the extinct word for the steelhead runs at 200 or 524, I think. Mm -hmm. Gotten, well, what do you expect? There's, uh, you know, thousand pound sea lions mm -hmm. sucking these things down as fast as they can. Well, so that changes. Legislation puts it in place to relocate some of those predators. And now the runs, I think I read 2,500, 2,400, something like that. So the Willamette Fall, uh, one, one that stands out in my mind is a few years ago on that steelhead, um, the wild steelhead return. It was, it was down to like 300 fish or something. Yeah. And there, there was an abundance of California sea lions there at the Willamette Falls because it's just a, it's basically a roadblock for them fish. And they're yeah. just getting hammered. Yeah. Over the course, I believe it was about two years, 18 months, two year window, they removed 33 sea lions. The uh, immediate return of steelhead was north of 3,000. The fall, You're talking about the, fall, the, the slabs, Willamette yeah. Falls, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that right there is a, it's a sampling, but it's a great indication on the impact that a large group of sea lions could have in a small controlled area, right? Yeah, well, uh, you think we would learn. You guys had your own big sea lion. What was it, Herschel? Herschel, up yeah. at the Ballard Locks, way back <laughs> in, the, in the 70s, early 80s. Yeah, you but think we would have learned from that. We don't, because <laughs> right now, so we're talking springers, you know. Uh, people are excited to get out there, and if the, wa if the water and the weather starts warming up a little bit, we're going to get into the bait lab here in a little bit and start talking some springer tactics. But, you know, it's, it's, it's go time, right? We're mid-March, beyond mid-March. It's really yep. starting to kind of, everybody's getting antsy to go do that. Well, 
There's no less than a couple hundred sea lions at the mouth of the Cowlitz right now. It's the most that have ever been there. There are people posting pictures and videos like, I have been fishing here for I don't know how many years. I've never seen this. They, they obviously, they follow the, sm the smelt in. They do it every year now. But to have that many camped out right at the mouth of the Cowlitz, and there's just no sense of urgency. Yeah, I get it. WDFW and NOAA, they signed off on an agreement with the tribes and the managers and everybody's on board. They have XYZ number of sea lions and stellar sea lions that they can remove out of the Columbia and some of the tributaries, but there's so much red tape that you have to identify XYZ sea lion. It has to be uh, observed eating fish uh, on a number of occasions, but there's a lot of red tape. Then you can remove and exterminate that sea lion. Okay, so that one. And now you have to go pick another one out of the... Mm -hmm. So they're not there sunbathing. They're there to eat. No, Every there one of again, them. the data point you have to use is when, when those... Big Bubba's were listed as endangered, I think, 30-something mm -hmm. years ago. There was 1972. 30,000, 30, 30 or 32,000. Mm -hmm. It's 10x that now. Yeah, you yeah. think they're endangered? No. <laughs> See, there, when they enacted the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act in 1972, there was no ceiling. No yeah. biologist, no marine biologist, nobody stepped in to say, when the carrying capacity gets to this number, yeah. we're good. And then we have to figure out a way to keep them from exceeding that number because we will create a man-made imbalance is exactly what we have. Now, we're just talking pinnipeds. There's tons of documentation, as you know, on the avian predation on the Columbia River and the down outmigrant smolt relative to steelhead. Yeah. I mean, 70% of them are being consumed within the confines of the Columbia before they ever hit the estuary. So I have a question for you. Yeah. Why can't we get rid of comorants? What's keeping us from getting rid of comorants? Federal bureaucracy, red tape, the whole... I mean, it is what it is, right? There's just no... I mean, it's kind of a pump, but nobody's willing to pull the trigger. Yeah. And uh, a lot of guys would be willing to pull the trigger. I know that. I've advocated to say, hey, in our um, in our fall uh, waterfowl hunting opportunity tournaments, yeah. give us Fun give games. us a bonus limit of you know a number of mergansers or cormorants or whatever uh, that yeah. don't go against your current seven retention in many areas. But I can have a bonus of three or four cormorants, or I could shoot a total of ten ducks. They could all be cormorants if you want, but I can get my five to seven good eaters, and I can also help annihilate yeah. a few of the yeah. nuisance birds, right? Um, you could sell an extra stamp for that. You could generate monies to uh, promote that program. Uh, waterfowl hunters would come out and say, yeah, I'll pay my extra five bucks, my extra 10 bucks, so I can eliminate three or four mergansers every day I get to go out and bird hunt. People would step up and do this. It would cost the agency zero to nothing, but for some reason, we can't come up with ideas like this that are conducive to making change on the recognized issues. Uh, pe people that follow the show have heard me say it numerous times. There's, there was, a, there was a information that came out. It was an 11-year study on the avian predation from the confluence of the Snake River to the estuary water of the Columbia River to recognize they have 14 bird colonies impacting our out-migrant steelhead smolt that enter the ocean. 11 years. So I'm as frustrated as you. Hatcheries are not the reason our fish are not surviving. We've listed a number of them. You've listed a number of them this evening. Um, well, yeah, we're doing a better job with hatcheries. Obviously, there right. are always budget constraints, but we, we're learning from the past. And by the way, uh, we are probably number one advocates of wild fish. We, it would be... Great if every river was teeming with wild fish and sure. didn't have to bother with this stuff, but that's not going to happen. We we managed to change the habitat quite a bit, but in the meantime, it's it, there's just too much logic and science behind having hatcheries, and and there are rivers that should be just left the way they are and let them let them have teeming abundance of wild fish. That's great, mm -hmm. but. But don't uh, don't think for a minute that if we eliminated hatcheries next year, that uh, that uh, whales and uh, pinnipeds and the ocean are going to be selective about not uh, messing with the wild fish. Just let them go. Give them They're a free pass. Go, right. They are going to go down. Right. And the best study I've read says two to three hundred years if you eliminated all hatchery, um, uh, any hatchery fish in the Northwest. If you, if you eliminated the hatcheries 
that it would take two or three hundred years to bring the wilds back. Bring the wild fish back. If conditions are right. If do, off the top of your head, do you know of any successful wild recovery programs where they've removed hatchery programs off of said river and we've seen an abundance return or a significant uptick in the return of wild fish? You know, I'm pretty sure there are. I think that there are unique situations. There's not, there's a not, not enough anecdotal evidence and, of those things working to say that, yeah, okay, that sure. worked there. It's just, it's environment, it's no ocean conditions, it's predation. But uh, I, I can't say that there aren't any. That would, that would be insincere of me to say there aren't any. Sure, I have to believe that there's a couple and um, uh, maybe they're not, you know, rebounding at the pace folks would like to see them rebound. But that being said, we have recognized gene banks. We have recognized, you know, boundary areas where it will be wild fish only. And it's going to take an awful lot of time. Um, you just said two to 300 years. We don't have that kind of time for all these contributing river yeah. systems into our ocean, into our Puget Sound, to, uh, to watch these wild fish bounce back in numbers that are sustainable. Um, we have too much at stake here. We have an industry that is built around hatchery fish. The commercial fishing industry was built around hatchery fish. The recreational industry has been built around hatchery fish. You remove all them hatcheries, and we're gonna get into that next segment here, uh, economic impact what that looks yeah. like in that study that you guys helped uh, get done, really what it means. Yeah, it's been overlooked in a lot of the legislation. Right. Uh, I know you have a, a commission, much like our commission. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the DNA is yeah, not such from that the they're going to yep. go out and shoot comorants with you next no. weekend. But, no, they, uh, they so want to protect them. Right. Big hurdle. Yes. Yes, but we'll talk about that economic okay. stuff. That, that's what I'm looking forward to. All right, don't go anywhere. We're going to jump up for a quick break. We come back. We'll be in the bait lab. Uh, rigging for Springer fishing uh, coming up here in the next couple weeks. We have until April 7th to get out and hopefully grab a few of those on the Columbia. And then we have tributary fisheries to look forward to. But we're on the troll. Inline triangle rotator, fish flash, or 360 flasher. What's your preference? When to run them and why? Going to do that in Bay Lab. We come back after this break right here at Fish on Northwest. All Defiance boats are built without any structural wood materials. That is why all boats are backed with a lifetime warranty. All Defiance boats come standard with large fish boxes that are fully insulated so that you can ice your fish properly all day. All Defiance boats are foam flotation filled and unsinkable for the ultimate in safety while fishing offshore. Before you buy any boat, stop by or call Defiance boats today to ensure you are getting the very best glass boat your money can buy. If you're looking for the best fishing rods in the world, you really do need to take a look at the edge rods. I designed and built new machinery, and I think this new machinery has enabled us to build blanks like no other company can build without this equipment. There is no other rods in the world that are as good as these rods. You owe it to yourself to take a good look at them. New days, new beginnings, new friends, new loves, new dreams, new goals, new scenery, new job. No matter what the next chapter holds, Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate will be there to help you find the new that's right for your lifestyle at any stage of your life. Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. Expect better. All right, welcome back here at Fish on Northwest. We are in the Bait Lab. Bait Lab presentation is brought to you by Sport Co. and Outdoor Emporium. So tonight we're talking Springer, Spring Chinook fishing, and some of the options when it comes to flashers, inline rotator, 360 flasher. Got a number of varieties here. Uh, are we dragging bait? Are we dragging Brad's uh, cut plugs? What size? Herring? cut plug or in helmet, uh, what are the benefits of, slider weight or fixed. There is a variety, but this is basically a breakdown of some of the things that I like to do that I've had success with. Uh, not just springer fishing, this is applicable to a number of different fisheries, but when it comes to springers, you kind of got to get your program dialed in. And these are some basic takeaways that I rely on. Next week, I'm going to jump into some more detailed information on the trail end of this entire setup when it comes to bait. 
and scent and all those types of things. So tonight it's all about the rigging. Um, what I prefer to start with is my uh, edge rod, my 360 Pro. These rods are designed, engineered, and built with the uh, working of a 360 rotating flasher in mind because of the way the rod loads and recoils and giving that ideal cadence and thump to your 360 rotating flasher no matter what style or size of flasher you're running, okay? That is, that is this rod in its best form. That is what it likes to do. That being said, it works fantastic for any of your lead dropper fisheries. It works really well when we're spinning inline rotator Big Al Fish Flash from uh, Yakima Bait. It also works fantastic because of the amount of glass in this rod as a downrigger rod. So if you're trying to equip your boat uh, <clears throat> with rods that are suitable for lead fishing and downriggers, the 360 Pro, this is a SAR 1065. This is a 12 to 30 pound, 10 and a half foot rod. I will run this all day long on my lead fisheries. I'll run it all day long on my downrigger fisheries in the salt water. It gets it done for me. So. Uh, Basically, put a, uh, a, oops, a good reel on here with a 65-pound braid. And I'm not running any top shot on here because I don't need to. We're running braid right down to our terminal end. So what does that look like? Here's a basic setup. Braid right to a heavy-gauged uh, snap swivel. Um, is where it terminates. Above that, I put on the VIP sliding lock. These work fantastic. I, I opted to start using these a couple years ago, and uh, I won't go back. The VIP slider lock gets it done. It's what I'm clipping my weight to, and I prefer to rig a slider for the reason that I want my weight to move up and down my main line if, in fact, the lead hanging on the end of this 12 inch dropper gets caught up in the net and the fish takes off, the fish can still travel and it's not gonna snap my line. So I fish a slider. Typically I'm running it on a 12 inch dropper. Now you'll see the difference between the dropper and the bumper. 12 inch dropper, 24 inch bumper. Okay, that goes to my fish flash. Let me talk about the colors on these, uh, on these droppers. So this one is red. This is made by Coldwater uh, Strong. Ken makes some very nice products. And I like to run a red dropper based on my clear model that's on my bumper in the fact that they do get tangled up. I can tell which one is which. It's just, it just makes it easier and cleaner for me. Um, you can make 24 inch bumpers, 12 inch droppers all day long. They're not that difficult, but uh, Ken makes some really nice products. These 12 inch bumpers come in packs of three. You can also get them uh, a complete kit. Here you go, this is cold water strong. It's your bumper, it's your uh, quick release on your flasher, it's your dropper, it all comes in one. Now, Ken is not a sponsor of this show, I just wanna make that clear, but I believe in his products and I use them when it's applicable. I like the strength of his uh, droppers and I like the fact that they're red so I can see the difference between that and my bumper. So, 24 inch bumper, these are made with a nice, uh, uh, B chain swivel, 24 inches of 150 pound mono, okay, which is plenty strong to get it done. It also is nice that it helps prevent line twists. If you're running lighter line than that, uh, you're apt to get uh, things twisted up from time to time. 24 inch bumper goes into a uh, girthy uh, ball bearing swivel with a dual lock right to my Big Al's fish flash. Now this is the 10 inch BMK. This color out on the Columbia, for whatever reason, Bill figured something out years ago, Bill Monroe Jr., and they customized this color for him. It's all he runs 99.9% .9 of the time. 10 inch, especially in water with some turbidity in there, got a little dirtiness to the water. That Columbia, when they're flowing water and you get snow melt going into the spring, things get a little dirty in the Willamette, whatnot. This color shows up, reflects really well in dirty water. I use it religiously, and I like to go with the 10 inch versus the eight inch. Simply for the bigger profile, bigger flash, uh, the drag in comparison is nominal. So you don't really know the difference there, but simply by running a larger flasher, uh, bigger profile, bigger flash, it has that better tractability. 
goes into a dual lock right into a swivel onto my leader. Now, when it comes to herring leaders, it's a typical mooching rig. I'm running a four-aught hook and a, and a three-aught hook as the trailer. The bait hooks into the four-aught hook here. We'll talk about rigging on uh, plug cut herring and whatnot next week. I'm running 30, sometimes even 40 pound fluorocarbon. Now I know a lot of guys will run monofilament, the dirty uh, Columbia, you don't need to run fluorocarbon, whatever. Um, I just tie all my leaders throughout the season. I pretty much stick to the same thing. I like a good girthy leader that I know I can put some pressure to these fish. If I got sea lions in the area, wanna crank them in, I'm gonna get after it and uh, tighten down that drag and really put the pressure to them. And uh, so, you know, nothing wrong with 40 pound, plus it, uh, the, 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 the bait spins just fine, the rotator spins fine, and uh, it's a little bit springy, so it doesn't tend to spin up as much. I like the way it acts in water, so I stick with it. 52 inches. I've gone back and forth between, you know, four foot, five foot, five and a half. Again, dirtier water, even when it cleans up a little bit, I just stick with 52 inches. That works for me. I know guys will uh, change in distance away from your flasher. I like it being within that 50 inch range to that flasher. Again, especially if the water's a little bit dirty, okay? So let's talk about the, uh, the bumpers and um, some different line gauges. So one thing I discovered, I was running cold water products, um, uh, cold water uh, strong products on a number of fisheries in the Columbia. And you can get these bumpers in 24, you can get them in 18. So if you're running inline rotator or a 360 flasher, you can get them in uh, 24 or 18. So 18 inches is gonna just make that uh, much more erratic uh, and shorter uh, uh, throw on your 360. It's gonna be a tighter circle. You get a 24 inch bumper on there, it's gonna elongate that throw a little bit more. Kind of open up that uh, oblong circle a bit and make a bigger profile. One thing I noticed, uh, and I talked to Ken about this and he agreed. So if you look at the terminal ends on his presentations, a lot of them have glow, high visibility. This is 200 pound mono, so this is the heavy gauge stuff. And fishing in fisheries where there seems to be a lot of activity, a lot of other boats present, a lot of uh, gear in the water, I was realizing that this high profile stuff tend to push fish off. I wasn't getting bit. And so I went back to um, some, of the, some of the standard bumpers that I had made, uh, 150 pound mono, obviously there's no um, big flash or glow or anything on that for attractability. So uh, what I realized is in busy fisheries, lots of activity, lots of flash, lots of things going on, you just dumb it down a little. And so Ken actually did also come out with, and much like I run, you know, 150 pound uh, seems to get it done, a little lower profile black ends uh, crimped on to his terminal ends of his uh, rigging. So you can get them in 18 and 24 inch bumpers and droppers uh, of 12 inch. And it's just all kind of incognito, low profile, again, smaller diameter, less drag. And this stuff works really well. I tend to tie all mine up very similar, barrel swivel at the end, okay. I got a B chain, a Brad's B chain at the uh, terminal end of the uh, bumper. I run 24 inch, uh, 24 inch bumpers 90% of the time, especially when I'm running 360 flashers. 24 in front of the flasher, 12 inches on the dropper, and I'll use the ones I make. I'll use the uh, cold water strong ones in black. Um, when applicable, really dirty water, maybe even out in the salt water, I'll grab some of these higher visibility ones and run those. So don't be afraid of those. If you're looking for things that are pre-made so you don't have to make them, uh, check out Cold Water Strong, and now you have options. You can get the low profile ones, 150 pound test, mono, you can get the 200 pound, whatever's your preference. I'm just giving you guys some options out there as far as your rigging. Okay, uh, in, uh, inline rotators, I'll tell you what, most success I have found over the years, it comes to the BMK, um, if I'm not running that, green and chartreuse, yellow and chartreuse, this is yellow and chartreuse with red. There seems to be a combination, uh, either reds, uh, the moon glow, moon jelly, uh, moon burst, depending which company you work for is what we call this. So high visibility, high UV, lots of flash, and the greens and chartreuses are one of my favorite go-tos, even in stained or dirty water. They just seem to get it done time and time again. I'll talk next week about 
carrying up some of your baits with chartreuse and some options there. But if I have to change things around and I'm running um, a couple different options on my boat, I'm definitely starting with some reds. I'm definitely starting with some chartreuses and some yellows. Uh, one thing I do like about the Max Lure Triangle Flasher Inline Rotator, the nice thing they did is they've made them so you can open them up. You can slam a whole bunch of tuna in here right out of the can, snap the top back on this, uh, this bad boy and put that into operation. And now you have a tremendous amount of scent that filters out of this sink. And if you notice, we got red, we got chartreuse, we got flash, it's got it all and it has a scent chamber. They're a 360 flasher with a fin. They rotate fantastic. I actually rigged this one to be a breakaway because I like to fish all my 360s as a breakaway. So I'll use the Max uh, 11 inch 360 flasher. Again, this one comes apart. You put tuna right in this. We use this in the salt water using the Columbia. Works great. This is a novel alternative. Again, we got flash, we got chartreuse. If we're running a series of 360 flashers and you have four or five, six rods in your boat, it doesn't hurt to put one of these out to see if that extra scent attractiveness, that tuna in oil coming out of this flasher makes a difference. My preferred one, I go with the brads. The 360 brads with the, with the breakaway, it's built right in. You know, a lot of these flashers, if you go with uh, like a Pro Troll uh, Chrome in mirror, which works great, uh, a lot of confidence in this one here. Um, you either have to rig a breakaway on it if you choose to fish breakaway, or you have to purchase separately the breakaway features to put on these, okay? The nice thing about the Brad's 360 flashers, one, they are a 10 inch flasher versus an 11 inch flasher, no big deal. Um, they're stackable and they have the breakaway mechanism built right into it. So when the fish hits the terminal end, it releases that bungee, which gives you a free floating breakaway flasher. The other unique thing they have about them is at the top end, your pull point can be adjusted. If you are in faster current, you wanna fish the tip of the uh, flasher by putting your B chain through that top point um, so it's the highest pull point and exposes the less amount of fin forward of your pull point into the water. Um, I typically run them on the center setting for the majority of the speed of current or uh, current that I fish in. If you have real slow water, you can put it back here at the farthest setting, which exposes the most lip out in front of your pull point, which causes that thing to dig a little harder and it really gets a good rotation going on minimal current. So. The cool thing about the brads is the adjustability and the fact that it has a built-in breakaway. Now I like to couple that out the back of the boat with a brads cup plug. Now this is a mini cup plug. Uh, it works fantastic for spring chinook. I rig it with uh, two one-aught hooks or a two-aught and a one-aught trailer, depending on what I have available. Um, the thing I like about these obviously is you can fill them with scent. Tuna is my go-to. I typically mix my Potsky's krill powder in with my tuna, put it in my Brad's cup plug. And as you see, a variety of these, again, as uh, we demonstrated with Scott Call, owner at Brad's <clears throat> earlier this summer, don't be afraid when you're going after Chinook to run some of these KCPs, the kokanee cup plugs. Yeah, they're small, but them big Chinook will go after these uh, time and time again. Definitely put one-aught hooks on your kokanee cut plugs. Don't weight them down with anything more than double one-aught hooks. Couple beads out the back door and um, keep the hooks fully exposed. And I am running those behind these rotating flashers on 30 inch leaders, okay? I want a lot of whip. I want a lot of uh, action. This thing is spinning like crazy. The flasher's whipping around. If I really want a lot of whip and a tighter window, again, I put this on an 18 inch bumper, but typically I'll run them on a 24 inch bumper and depending on the current and how strong it's pushing or how deep of water, we're fishing eight, 10, 12 ounces of lead, okay? So um, 360 rotator, Brad's cup plug out the back, 30 inch leader, herring off of my inline uh, rotating flashers, 52 inch leader, herring in a helmet, which I'll get into next week, 52 inch leader. It's just some of the standbys I do. And again, you can choose to get the heavy gauge 200 pound with the high glow, you can get the 150 pound test that is uh, dumbed down and not, uh, not so it pushes fish off. Rig your weights so that they slide and don't get hung up. And uh, get yourself a good solid fishing rod like a uh, 360 Pro Series from Edge. Okay, I think that's gonna cover this week. 
Next week, we'll be back in here talking bait in the bait lab right here at Northwest. Don't go anywhere, jumping out for a quick break. We'll be right back. A Northwest favorite for almost 40 years, Arima boats are manufactured with pride in Bremerton, Washington. All Arima boats are built without any structural wood materials. That is why Arima boats are backed with a lifetime warranty. Arima can offer every boat with Honda outboard packages so that you can take advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty from your Honda outboard. Call or stop by Arima boats today and let them help you get into your very next boat. Yep, for sure. Oh yeah, big fish. Yeah, buddy, nice fish. Beauty. Gorgeous fish. Bobby's on the board. We got a good one. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, jeez, come on. Nice fish. Nice fish. Welcome back here in the studio with uh, Don New, director at Hatchery and Wild. Uh, looks like a lot of you enjoyed that bait lab. Sorry, I was bouncing around there a bit, trying to cram a whole bunch of info in in a real short amount of time. So hopefully you gained something out of that. And Don, we were just talking, uh, Ken, and a lot of folks on here agree, Ken at Coldwater Strong makes some really good high quality gear. Yep. Well worth the investment, doesn't. right? So yep. uh, less headaches, man, less twists, less line twists. Uh, more time in the water, basically what it comes down to. So let's talk a little bit before we get out of here about this uh, economic impact. So um, let's just talk like kind of, you know, regionally, geographically, you got a couple hatcheries and we shut down and remove those hatcheries out of the equation, thereby reducing, minimizing, completely removing any opportunity to go out and fish, even catch and release or harvest whatever's available mm -hmm. uh, in a particular watershed outside of a small town um, within a geographical footprint of, you know, a certain river system. What, what, did, what was garnered from this extensive report? What did they look at in regards to that type of stuff? I mean, what, what is this yeah. whole thing about? Yeah, so... <clears throat> We talked about the genesis of Hatchery Wild three years ago. First thing was that we're here to stay. We started with four important uh, partners, business partners. We're at 260 now, and we have all of the advocacy groups, NSIA, CCA Washington, CCA Oregon, Guides and Packers, different groups that are behind us. So we, we, we got traction that way <clears throat> with no expense because we didn't have any money to spend. Yeah. <laughs> and so the next one was the the beneficial video we had to do that got that yep. out of the way yep. and then we did the hatchery while the uh, hatcheries aren't the enemy we finished that but th two years ago we realized what the lawmakers weren't understanding was were the economic impacts of hatcheries going out mm. they didn't think about that they I, I don't think there was any consideration for the mom and pop store or the shia law end down at the end of the run or the gas station so we started two and a half years ago actually raising funds which was substantial because we got a bid from a couple of different organizations and we ended up with highland economics and uh we had to pay them uh, a lot of money to get the study together it's an economic impact study of hatcheries in oregon and washington and um we're just now uh, providing this to, uh, to anybody that wants it you can go up on our website mm -hmm. it's 60 pages it's not you know it's not entertaining there'll be parts of it are but um, and we just finished extracts for six counties in Washington and six in Oregon that are hot spots. Oh. In Oregon, Coos Bay, there were the, uh, I, I didn't mention that uh, Robert Kratzer and, and uh, Cameron Black are on our board up mm -hmm. here in Washington. Uh, th so uh, with, with their involvement, we're going to try to get some distribution on this so it can get in front of these folks, these elected officials, and they can see that it's not just a matter of shutting down a hatchery and saving a little money for some staff. It's it has impact, impacts on, on a lot of people. So now this is available. 
Uh, do I have time to read one quick little? Absolutely. Thing? Okay. Yeah. So within this, it, it's from the overall impact of sport fishing in the two states brought to the state, the economic impact, down to uh, how much money a hatchery will make in uh, fish food or, or visit visitors, all those kinds of things that are economics. So um, estimated net economic value of hatcheries and hatchery fish in Oregon and Washington, what would you guess is the value, this is value to recreational uh, anglers. In Oregon, 227, 228 million dollars. In Washington, it's 412, a little over 412 million dollars. So this, th these aren't little numbers. No. And I don't think any of these folks that are making these decisions realize uh, that we're, we can't, we're, we're going to be louder. That's what we're trying to bring. And yeah. we're going to be louder and smarter with data because the, the naysayers that are spending uh, lots of money on lawsuits mm -hmm. and little soirees and cocktail parties, <laughs> I, I, yes. you know, yes. uh, we can't fight that. But Enticing their donors, yeah, yeah. to keep their uh, propaganda going. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. So what we found uh, with situations down in Oregon with uh, Rock Creek on the Omqua, North Omqua and Lieberg and some couple places up here, we can, we can light up our followers and our fans and we can get a lot of email and uh, Olympia and Salem fast yeah. and we've got to do that because we're not going to be able to outspend them. Well, we I was going to ask you, I mean, you, this, uh, this study has provided a, <laughs> a substantial amount of data and it shows the economic um, benefits and the impacts when, you know, those programs are removed. You think legislators pay attention to this stuff? I mean, you get in front of them and go, look, this community will suffer this amount of money is not being contributed into the overall economic um, opportunity here within this community if we remove this hatchery program. Do you think yeah. that resonates with them? Do they even pay attention to that? Well, I, I can only really speak for Oregon. We have a lot, couple of representatives mm -hmm. and state senators that are real advocates. But if you, if you look at doing nothing for the last 60 years yeah. versus at least trying, then I think we're succeeding because we are trying. And there have been several situations, like I mentioned earlier, where we're asked to come in and put our brand on a joint letter that goes to the right person to, to make legislation go our way. But we just have to get, uh, we have to get louder and, and we have to have an educated community that understands why they are pro-hatchery. Yeah. You need to be able, if you push them, they need to be able to say why. Because if you push the, a lot of the people that are anti-hatchery, they got nothing. Sure. They, they got no data, no real data, no recent data. No. I mean, it's, it's hurting right now when some of these studies like Hood River and mm -hmm. Clackamas come out with real information from promises that were made a quarter of a century ago, and now the facts are coming in, and we were wrong. Yeah. And, and you know, shame on us, but who would have thought 30 years ago when someone asked me if you should eliminate a 20,000 summer steelhead run on the Clackamas River because then we'll have wild fish teeming sure. in the river. And that did not happen. And you can't argue that. Well, when the question's posed to you and you don't have anything to verify or dismiss or, you know, truly gain understanding, it go, well, you know, that, that sounds reasonable. I mean, I guess I could get on board with that, right? Yeah. Um, and then they give you the, well, it's going to take two life cycles, and then it ends up being, you know, 15 life cycles. Yeah. Um, and we're still not there. So um, the, the efforts to change the narrative and this, this campaign of re-education, I think, is valid. It's important. Um, I'm waiting for them to come out with new data to support the cause. Um, I don't see a lot of new data. I see efforts in certain watersheds, which uh, hats off to them. There's a lot of effort being put in to biological diversity, studies that are being done, gene banks that are being recognized, habitat um, that is recognized as probability of high recovery based on this basin in the upper watershed recovery op options, right? There's a lot of things being done. Um, but to simply come out and say, we need to stop hatchery production because it is truly the demise of wild fish. I, we have, I wish years ago, they would have recognized we have put and take fisheries that need to continue and will be sustained because we rely on them. One, produces a, a 
livelihood for a number of guides to fish. And so my, my, uh, my comparison would be the Cowlitz River. There used to be a number of guides that would earn their living 365 days a year on that river. You could fish for something in that river year round. It's a put and take fishery. Now, do we really think we can bring that back as a, as a you know, predominant wild fish? Run? No, it's a large piece of water. Yeah, we have contributors. You know, we got the Tootle and other rivers that jump in, that dump into it. And there's been sections on the Tootle that have been recognized as a gene bank, and um, yeah. rightfully so. So you might have encounters with some wild fish in the Cowlitz, but the Cowlitz overall, your recovery is futile, and it needs to be looked upon and ramped back up to like what it once was. Another thing that does is it provides tremendous opportunity for not just guides, but recreational angling overall year round, which takes a tremendous amount of pressure off of a lot of these other smaller rivers that are really struggling now because of the uh, shift in effort. We've seen a tremendous effort shift in a number of our rivers here in Washington because of the lack of production in a number of rivers, shortened seasons, closures, lack of opportunity, oh, this river's open for six weeks, Weeks, let's all go there, right? Yeah. So as we continue to remove these hatcheries, it has an impact overall on our opportunities and whatnot. But this economic thing, I would really like to think state representatives and senators and those yeah. that make decisions would pay attention to this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I th- it, it is a fact, I think, that the lawmakers don't get what we as sport fishing people are all about. Yeah. They, if they change something, if they shut down a, a hatchery, they see it as, oh, boo-hoo, you know, those guys out there killing fish, it's just a hobby that's going to be curtailed a little bit or they'll just go somewhere else. They, so they weren't looking at the economic impact. Right. They also weren't considering that, that we vote. We, this, this group of us vote. Sure. And that's a big bunch of people. And we're also contributing to the habitat and to the abundance of the rivers like nobody else. We're yep. the ones that are giving our time <clears throat> yep. to make things right. And yep. so that we have to get them to understand that, especially when with our, with our commission, they're making these emotional decisions mm-hmm. on things that they know nothing about. You guys too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> we're, it's almost like it was... Right uh, <laughs> it's almost like it was planned or yeah. something, right? But but it is what it is. And I don't think it's going to make a big shift anytime soon. Right. I can only speak mainly for, for Oregon and Multnomah County and what's happening in, in our state. Sure. But uh, we watch what you guys are doing. You guys do the same. And, man, we got to get together. We have to – the organizations have to figure out how to really get along and at least – when it's time to show up at Olympia or show up in Salem, people know we're there. Yeah. And they know what we represent economically yep. from, from a, a base of uh, people that work in the industry and, and get that their decisions aren't just decisions to eliminate an opportunity for a hobbyist. If I was a state representative, say, in southwest Washington, and somebody came to me and said, hey, representative, you realize they're going to shut down this hatchery. And here's a report. Maybe you want to peruse this and look at the economic impact to the communities of which the constituents you serve. And you read through that and you go, well, I'll be damned if they're going to shut down my hatchery. I mean, there's some real teeth to this thing yeah. that these decision makers need to pay attention to. Now, I guess the, uh, the next effort here is to get it in front of them, to get them yeah. to actually take it on and read it and understand what's at stake here. Yeah. You know? The parsed out uh, extracts for six counties in Washington, six in Oregon, aren't on the site yet. The whole study's there, and I think a lot of you guys, folks out there, would enjoy reading it and, yeah. uh, and seeing what's there. But those one-pagers for your county, most you know, the hot counties here sure. in the north or up uh, down south, are uh, it's good stuff, and we're making it available to anybody that wants to, to use it. Fantastic. Well, can't thank you enough for uh, not just joining me here on the show, but sitting through the, uh, you know, the other, uh, the hunting talk and whatnot. So. <laughs> I like the flipping turkey. <laughs> yeah, the backflip turkey. Backflip yeah, turkey. It's a classic. So uh, really appreciate you and the efforts you're doing, Don. I know um, it, is, uh, it is due to folks like you working behind the scenes so diligently because of the passion that you have for the industry um, that, you know, that gives us hope, right? Yeah. Keeps it going. So uh, you continue to do your works. We'll continue to do ours here. And, yeah. Uh, try to help you get the message out there. And um, folks can t- contact uh, Hatchery and Wild, find information where. Give them, the, give them the contact points of where they can get this stuff. Yeah. 
we're, we're raising funds now for a, a short four to six minute broodstock video. Perfect. Because so, we feel that that's really important to our future. Yeah, that'd be huge. It's provable. You yep. Can, you can see it. What's yeah, going on? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Real good. Well, uh, again, can't thank you enough. Appreciate you, uh, you. joining me here this evening. And uh, now you got a nice long drive home so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. in the weather. So, all right, that is going to do it for us. Ran a little long tonight, but we had plenty of uh, content to discuss with Don. And I uh, want to thank him for coming in, uh, sharing what is going on exactly with Hatchery and Wild um, coexist because it is something you folks need to be familiar with. And if you're not, please go to their Facebook page, go to social media, look up Hatchery and Wild Coexist, and it's going to take you to all their social media platforms and their webpage. So, um, yes, enjoy this great weather we got coming in for the next couple days. Trying to get the boat over the pass tomorrow. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Uh, might have to wait till Saturday, but got some great east side fishing and filming to to take off on here and uh, hope to bring that content to you guys over the next couple weeks so uh do what you can get out this weekend get ready for that youth turkey hunt coming up april 1st and uh be safe in whatever you do we will see you next week right here i believe tommy's back next thursday 6 p.m right here fish on northwest <laughs>